No poor bastard ever won a space race by flying with Boeing. The trick is to get the other poor dumb bastard to fly with Boeing. Today we're engaged in a new space race and it's important that we win this race. Americans will not tolerate a loser. Americans play to win all the time. That's why Americans have never lost and will never lose a war. I, I mean a space race. All this stuff you hear about the general public not wanting space flight, wanting to stay out of orbit and work on problems down here is a load of horse dung. People love space, all real people. If they get the chance, they would love the sting of launch and the clash of landing. When you were kids, you all admired those brave enough to be first to try new things. The big league names like Neil Armstrong, John Young, and Sally Ride. People love an explorer and will not tolerate the mundane. Fifty years from now, when you're sitting by your view of Earth below and your grandkids ask, what did you do to get us all the way up here? You won't have to cough and say, well, I shoveled shit on Twitter. And if you also want a pair of sunglasses that inspires you to do absolutely atrocious George C. Scott impersonations, well, you can order them in the description. Check it out. But in the meantime, what was all of that about? Well, it was essentially a call to action because NASA has recently released a 50-point plan for the future, a plan that simply cannot be funded by NASA alone. It's obvious that NASA NASA intends to have the entirety of the government and also the private sector to get engaged in going to space. It's absolutely vital that we do this because if we don't, other countries are going to take the lead, the most significant of which is obviously the People's Republic of China. So why am I only talking about 20 objectives in the title? Well, because 20 of these specific objectives I think can be tied in to Starship, not just Lunar Starship, but also the version of Starship they intend to use on going to Mars. So without further ado, I'm going to dive straight into these objectives that NASA has has laid out and talk about how Starship fits in and sometimes doesn't fit into these objectives. And we start out with objectives associated with the moon. The first of these is to develop cis-lunar systems that crew can routinely operate to lunar orbit and lunar surface for extended durations. Obviously, Lunar Starship is a good fit for this, although for smaller scale operations, in my opinion, smaller landers should be considered simply because in order to be used multiple times, Lunar Starship has to return all the way to LEO in order to be refueled, whereas something like the Dianetics Alpaca can return to the lunar surface multiple times as long as it has a relatively modest fuel depot in cis-lunar space, which means Lunar Starship would be a perfect fit for that particular mission, carrying as much as 200 tons worth of fuel that Alpaca could make use of. This would be sufficient fuel for Alpaca to make five round trips to the lunar surface with neither Alpaca nor Lunar Starship having to return to low Earth orbit. This is far more efficient in my opinion, especially in the early stages of Artemis. Plus, Alpaca is very low slung, which means it's going to be a lot easier to deploy it on the lunar surface, and then the crew on the Alpaca can manufacture landing pads for Lunar Starship when much more extensive 
offensive operations begin to take place. And this ties in with objective number two, to develop systems that can routinely deliver large surface elements to the lunar surface. That obviously is Lunar Starship and should be something that's used once we have extensive colonization established on the lunar surface or at least some kind of permanent base complete with landing pads. And then there's objective number three, to develop systems to allow crew to live and operate safely on the lunar surface and lunar orbit for extended periods of time with scalability to continuous presence to visit areas of interest for scientific research, conduct Mars analog activities, support industrial utilization, and conduct utilization activities. Now, of course, Lunar Starship has a massive fairing and a massive amount of space to set up a lunar base, at least in the early stages. The one thing that it lacks is scalability, even though it can certainly maintain a sizable crew of astronauts for a sustained period of time on the moon, it doesn't have that modular scalability that I think NASA is looking for for long-term habitation on the lunar surface. Consequently, in in the long run, we're going to need large habitats that can fit inside of Lunar Starship's fairing that can be deployed on the lunar surface, modular habitats that can be expanded into large lunar cities, such as this concept from the European Space Agency. Once again, this is not to say that Starship can't do all of these things, but there are certain applications more specifically designed for these tasks that Starship is really not as well suited to that can fit these goals a little bit better. And that's not a bad thing. It means that other countries, other companies, other agencies are going to be involved in this process and it's not all going to rest on SpaceX's shoulders, which is the last thing that we want. And that's just as well because Starship is going to be incredibly busy due to the fact that objectives four and five are specifically tailor-made for it. Number four is to develop a habitation system for crew in deep space for extended durations enabling future missions to Mars. And number five is to develop a transportation system that crew can routinely operate from the Earth-Moon vicinity to Mars orbit and the Martian surface. Nothing is better suited to these tasks than Starship. The only possible drawback to Starship is the whole Starship suicide dive that I've talked about in previous videos, where I wonder whether or not something as huge as Starship is going to be able to safely land on the Martian surface with such a thin atmosphere and be able to decelerate in time doing that last second pull-up maneuver that it tends to do during the tests that we've observed thus far. That having been said though, Starship is unquestionably the best solution to take for at the very least a large lander into Martian orbit and to deploy that lander on the Martian surface if you didn't want to take a chance with Starship itself. And also it's perfectly suited for objective number six, to develop a transportation system that can deliver large surface elements from Earth to the Martian surface. Nothing is better suited to that task than Starship. A hundred tons from LEO to Mars at once. Nothing else is going to be able to do that, and especially not as inexpensively as Starship. And then we have objective number seven, which is to develop systems for crew to live, operate, and explore on the Martian surface to address key questions with respect to science and resources. Obviously, Starship is capable of doing this as well, having an enormous fairing, which is more than capable of handling a large number of crew, plus all of the equipment and everything else they're going to require for a long duration mission on the Martian surface. Obviously, Star 
Starship is the best solution for this particular objective, and it is also the best solution for objectives number 11 and 12, and I know I'm skipping at this point, but it is to develop systems capable of returning large cargo mass from the lunar surface to Earth, including the capabilities necessary to meet scientific sample return objectives, and to develop systems capable of returning large cargo mass from the Martian surface to Earth, including the capabilities necessary to meet scientific sample return objectives. Both of these objectives are best served by Starship, especially on Mars, because you're going to be able to create fuel in situ on the Martian surface, utilizing water ice for your oxygen and also the saboteur method in order to create methane. This will allow Starship to carry out its mission as it's supposed to do, a reusable spacecraft designed to travel all the way to Mars and all the way back, and not just crew, but also possibly large cargoes as well. There are potentially large amounts of usable resources on Mars, including various types of rare Earths, 99% of which is currently dominated by the People's Republic of China, and this could serve as a long-term economic justification for a permanent Martian colony, another thing that would allow it to become self-sufficient. So Starship is well-suited to a wide variety of these objectives that NASA has come up with, and then there are other objectives that will be enabled by Starship. For example, to develop an incremental lunar power grid that is evolvable to support continuous human robotic operation and is capable of scaling to global power utilization and industrial power levels. Now that is a great big task and something that isn't going to be carried out by a single starship, nor should it be. Instead, starship is going to be able to transport the necessary equipment and hardware to build these kinds of power grids, whether they be solar or preferably nuclear, simply because any point on the moon is going to be shrouded in complete darkness at least half the time, so solar power grids are simply not going to be that efficient on the moon, and nuclear reactors are not a light piece of equipment and something you're definitely going to want to be transported by a large and reliable spacecraft, which hopefully Starship is going to be. In addition to that, any sort of habitats or any other structures that you transport to the moon must make maximum use of in situ resources, as you're seeing right here with this design from the ESA that makes use of lunar regolith. And this is coupled to the next objective, which is to develop lunar surface, orbital, and lunar to Earth communications, position, navigation, and timing architecture capable of scaling to support long term science, exploration, and industrial needs. Once again, not something that's going to be taken care of by Starship, but certainly all of the equipment required to set up a communications network is also going to be far easier to transport to the moon if you have something that's capable of carrying large amounts of cargo, obviously Starship. On top of that, the next objective is to demonstrate autonomous construction, which we're looking at right now, precision landing, surface transportation, industrial scale in situ resource utilization, and advanced manufacturing capabilities in support of future continuous human lunar presence and a robust lunar economy. And this in turn is connected to the next objective, which is to demonstrate technologies supporting cislunar orbital surface depots, construction and manufacturing, maximizing the use of in situ materials and support systems needed for continuous human robotic presence. All of these things are incredibly ambitious. A robust lunar economy? How the hell are you going to build something like that on NASA's budget? You aren't. Obviously, NASA intends to engage the private sector, billions and billions of dollars from private investors in order to make not only a lunar economy, but a Martian economy as well, making use of in situ resource utilization or ISRU from here on out. As you can see, this kind of thing allows us to build enormous structures and habitats, power stations, and everything else that you require 
for colonies on the moon and on Mars. We're going to start out with lunar colonies, learning how to establish these things in relatively close proximity to the Earth before we move on to establishing more ambitious colonies on Mars. The whole moon to Mars objective and all of these smaller objectives lays out NASA's overall plan, which is beyond exciting and it's obvious that Starship has to be a big part of it. And this plan makes it very clear that NASA intends to duplicate what they're doing on the moon on Mars as well from objectives 14, 15, and 16, which is to develop Mars surface power sufficient for the initial Mars demonstration mission, develop Mars surface, orbital, and Mars-to-Earth communication to support the initial human Mars demonstration mission, and to develop and demonstrate entry, descent, and landing systems capable of delivering crew and large cargo to the Martian surface, all of these being the first steps in establishing a permanent and long-term human presence on Mars. And this is more clearly laid out in the operations goals, and there's a bunch of them, and I'm only going to select four of them that are more closely associated with Starship, but the overall operations goal is to conduct human missions on the surface and around the moon, followed by missions to Mars. Use a gradual build-up approach. These missions will demonstrate technologies and operations to live and work on a planetary surface other than Earth, with a safe return to Earth at the completion of the missions. And here's just a few of those objectives. First of all, to characterize accessible lunar resources, gather scientific research data, and analyze potential reserves to satisfy science and technology objectives and enable ISRU on successive missions. Obviously, in situ resource utilization is going to be absolutely essential, not only to establish large scale colonies or bases on the moon, but especially on Mars, where you're looking at huge delays, not only in travel time, but also in communications. All of this needs to be self-sustaining, and you're not going to be self-sustaining without making use of the available resources. And the equipment necessary to use these resources is not terribly small or light. However, it is reusable, so this is the best solution for a long-term habitation on Mars or the Moon but nevertheless, you're going to need something that's capable of hauling all of this equipment to the lunar surface and to Mars, and this can't be done without Starship. Let's move on. Another important operational objective is to evaluate, understand, and mitigate the impacts on crew health and performance of a long deep space orbital mission, followed by partial gravity surface operations on the moon. This is obviously best served by by the Lunar Gateway, at least initially. The lunar, the lunar Gateway, rather, is going to allow us to simulate a long-term mission through deep space. It's exposed to all of the same problems, obviously microgravity, but also radiation and cosmic rays. The Lunar Gateway is going to be outside the protective sheath of Earth's magnetic field and therefore will be bombarded by the same amount of cosmic rays and radiation that any Earth to Mars mission is going to be subjected to. That being the case, Lunar Gateway is going to be an absolutely essential first step in our establishing a long-term presence on the Moon. Here's the problem. Our current designs for a Lunar Gateway are extremely small simply because we can't deploy a great deal of mass to cis-lunar space. Starship obviously will change all of that. One of the problems that we're facing right now is the ESA IHAB module that you're looking at right now cannot be deployed by Falcon Heavy. They're looking at devoting an entire SLS mission to deploy this one module. That is unnecessary. I feel that in the long run, Starship will be able to deploy much larger modules to this station and make it into an IHAB 
ISS in lunar orbit, essentially, which I think will be a very important aspect of our lunar colony. And it's not just in order to simulate deep space missions. On top of that, there are two other operational objectives. Number one, to demonstrate the capability of integrated robotic systems to support and augment the work of crew members on the lunar surface and in orbit around the moon, and to demonstrate the capability to remotely operate robotic systems that are used to support crew members on the lunar or Martian surface from the Earth or from orbiting platforms. The Lunar Gateway is specifically designed for these two particular objectives. It's going to be making use of robotic systems operated from the space station that will allow them to scout out various locations on the lunar surface, plus also build new habitats, all sorts of things that can be done in real time from an orbiting platform, and in the future could even be duplicated by a space station orbiting Mars. And that's just the first 20 objectives out of 50. I've barely scratched the surface on everything that NASA has in this long-term plan. It is ambitious. It is far beyond the financial capability of NASA, even if we took 20 or 30 years to do it. Obviously, NASA is putting forward a call to action to various agencies, organizations, and companies across the globe in order to become a part of this overall objective, to build a massive economy throughout the solar system to completely transform our lives here on Earth. I never thought that NASA would ever ever be this ambitious. And guess what? You can participate. All you need to do is follow the link that I have in the description and you can put your own comments, your own opinions on how these objectives can be satisfied until June 3rd of 2022. So don't wait. Follow that link in the description and put in your own opinions and let your voice be heard. And also make sure that NASA understands that until we have a permanent and established human presence throughout the solar system that will guarantee not only our long-term survival, but also our long-term prosperity until all of this becomes a reality reality, all of you are gonna stay angry about space.